For more on the top cybersecurity threats in the U.S. and around the globe, we are joined by Matthew Prince, CEO of Cloudflare, which works to improve performance and security for websites and data platforms, as well as Bloomberg Tech reporter Jordan Robertson, who you just heard in that piece. He covers cybersecurity for Bloomberg News in Washington. I want to start with election meddling, Matthew. And talk to me about what the risks are. The biggest risks are right now as we approach the midterm elections. You know, one of the things that we're seeing when we work with state, county, and local governments around the world is that oftentimes the aims of attackers are not necessarily to influence the direction in one direction or another, but just to discredit elections generally. And so we're seeing attacks against things like the, the sites that people can use to register to vote, where they can figure out what their polling place is, uh, where the official results are published after the fact, and making sure that there's integrity integrity in our entire election process is really critical for a democracy like the United States. So, for example, the Department of Homeland Security says these things called Albert sensors are now installed in 29 states and they sort of detect traffic coming in and traffic coming out. Is that enough? Well, you know, one of the things that's hard in the United States is that elections are inherently local. They're often run by uh, someone who is on their own, a county administrator or a city administrator, and then that percolates up to the federal level. And so th these people feel very vulnerable to the widespread attacks that are there. And so I think what the Department of Homeland Security has done is a great first step in understanding and being able to get a, a landscape on what is going on. But there needs to be additional effort to actually harden and support support those administrators that are helping support this critical function of our democracy. And of course, 29 states is not 50 states. Jordan, I know you've been doing a ton of research on this. You know, give us a little bit more on the state of play when it comes to where states are and what else they are working on to prepare. Sure. Yeah. As you mentioned, uh, you know, we had some reporting last year that, uh, you know, there were uh, 39 states uh, that were targeted by the Russians in the uh, known to be targeted by the Russians in the 2016 election. Since then, the Department of Homeland Security has suggested that essentially all the states were likely at least probed or scanned. And there are some fingerprints of these attackers on some of these election systems. Now, some of the national security folks we talk to will say that's a really big deal because these guys are no joke adversaries. These are serious adversaries. So if you've caught a finger print of them in one place, chances are there are things that you haven't caught in many more. So states are trying to get up to speed. Uh, but as Matthew points out, part of the problem is this, is that, you know, we like to think of hackers like we see in the movies, like they're breaking into these systems, they're tinkering with individual votes to tilt the election in favor of one candidate or the other. Uh, and, and what we've seen so far is it's not really what they're after. What they're really after is to disrupt things, like Matthew said, voter registration or even vote counting. Like one of the big concerns that national security folks has have is that the tally, like the, it, most counties and most states have upload sites where, uh, you know, individuals who are responsible, uh, you know, for the tallies at individual stations will go and upload results to, to the county level. Uh, you know, those are all data links that can be disrupted by hackers. And, and that's really what a lot of the folks in the national security community worry about is that those links are disrupted and just the counting uh, gets disrupted. Matthew. Is Russia the only country we need to worry about when it comes to U.S. election security and election security around the world, or are there other countries trying to get in on this game? I think that if you think about who the adversaries of the United States are and who would benefit from undermining the confidence in U.S. democracy, all of those countries are trying to think about how they can potentially influence elections. And so we spend less time thinking about who the particular countries are and spending more time thinking about how can we support those individual state, county, city officials that are administering these elections. So we run something called the Athenian Project, where we give away Cloudflare's core service to state, county, and local governments in order to make sure that regardless of it's the Russians or the Chinese or some kid in their, you know, in the basement in Iowa, if they're trying to disrupt your election, we want to say we've got your back and we can help protect you and help you stand up for whatever it is that comes apart. What's pernicious about this is, again, it doesn't matter, as Jordan said, whether the attack success, it, you know, pushes the election one direction or another. If we're worried about these attacks at all, it undermines our faith in democracy. And, and that's a lot of what the attackers are just trying to do. You know, these election, potential election attacks are very top of mind right now. But as Jordan talked about in his piece, you know, we're also concerned about attacks on the power grid. And these could have, you know, much more sort of far reaching implications. You know, what should we be worried about? right now beyond the midterms? Well, I think that, you know, the internet was never designed to do all of the things that it does. Uh, and we have come to rely on it 
as this critical piece of infrastructure, but it doesn't have the performance, security, reliability traits that we would have designed the network to have from the beginning. And so at Cloudflare, we're really proud of being at one of the organizations that's thinking about how we can build a stronger internet, and whether that's protecting elections through something like the Athenian Project, or that's working with power uh, companies to make sure that their infrastructure is hardened, or individual small businesses that might be targeted by hackers. What we need to have is a faith in the underlying foundation of the internet, regardless of what the services are being provided on top of it. Now, Jordan, something you've raised recently is not just attacks on software, but attacks on hardware, which can be even more difficult to detect, more difficult to prevent. You know, what is the scale of the threat here? Well, Emily, I mean, part of the problem with attacks on computer hardware, as we've seen this year with vulnerabilities such as Spectre and Meltdown, which attack computers' microprocessors, is they leave virtually no trace. So a lot of what we've talked about in the last 20 years regarding hacking has been software-based attacks. So once you, once you discover them, once you fingerprint them, uh, you can remove them from your computer in most cases. The problem with hardware attacks is twofold. One, they tend to leave no trace. There's no record of the, of the attack happening. And two, if you discover discover that uh, you know, a piece of malware is embedded in your hardware, you can't remove it. You literally cannot remove it. You have to throw away the hardware. So this is where spy agencies have dwelled for a very long time. I mean, this has been open season for years and years and years for the US and the Chinese and the Russians and you know, all the really advanced attackers that want to get deeply embedded inside an organization's computer systems. So, you know, the cybersecurity industry is really starting now to take a hard look at, you know, how do we secure these computer systems that are not part of government networks or banking networks or these networks that are already very heavily protected? You know, how do we secure hardware for the average person that's walking around with a supercomputer in their pocket, you know, in a phone, in a phone form? So these are threats that, uh, you know, again, the national security community, banking sector, uh, you know, the really highly Defended sectors have looked at for quite some time, uh, but when it comes to the consumer space, the idea of a hardware attack uh, is one that the security industry is really just now starting to grapple with, and there isn't an easy fix. So, Matthew, you know, Cloud, you've talked about how Cloudflare works with local governments. You know, you've also signed a pledge not to help the U.S. government with offensive cyber attacks. That said, you know. Some would say, isn't that sort of your duty to your country to help the United States fight some of these battles around the world? Well, we do, and we help them protect themselves. Um, we're, we're selling the armor, not the bullets, mm -hmm. in, in the in this cyber war. And so we work with large por portions of the U.S. government in order to help protect the infrastructure. And we do the same with other countries around the world. Again, I think for a functioning democracy to work, you have to have faith in the institutions and that those institutions have integrity. And there's been a lot of, of criticism of tech companies that they've actually helped undermine a lot of that integrity of elections. And at Cloudflare, we're trying to do it different. We're trying to say, how can we actually be a part of the solution to make sure that whatever the, the institutions we have, whether those are election systems or the power grid or whatever it is, wherever it is in the world, that those things have integrity and that you can trust that they are, they're something that you can believe in. All right, Matthew Prince, CEO of Cloudflare. Always great to have you here on the show. And Jordan Robertson of Bloomberg News, as always. Thank you both.